my accounts have to be readable to someone who has no idea what the life of an actor is like and yeah. knows that it will go up and down. So you need to be like, okay, I've got to make sure I, there's a threshold under which I do not earn because my accounts have to look stable. I need to look like a business someone wants to invest in. Hello and welcome to a very special edition of the Payroll Podcast. This is an episode brought to you following a private Q&A that I had with the cast of How Love Is Spelt, a play by Chloe Moss that's taking place at the Southwark Playhouse until the 28th of September. JGA Recruitment are a really proud sponsor of the show. It forms part of our commitment to supporting the careers of emerging young British theatrical talent in the UK. But more importantly, it gave me a unique opportunity to sit down with the cast and ask them some questions about payroll and the acting profession, about HR and the acting profession, and about all the things that make up the career of an actor or actress that perhaps we don't consider, perhaps we don't see. Of course, we're going to find out a lot more about the show as well. I think it's a really interesting insight with some fantastic actors and actresses, including Michelle Collins, Nigel Boyle, Duncan Moore, Benjamin O'Mahony, Yana Penrose, and Lana Wallace-Taylor. And it is, of course, directed by Charlotte Peters. The play itself is about a girl called Peter who's new in town, and she's looking for romance, she's looking for friendship, and it's the play is all about the exciting people that she meets along the way. I don't want to give too much away. I want to hand over to the cast. They give a much better account of it than I do. Most importantly, please stay tuned for what I think is a really interesting, fascinating and insightful view of what it is like to work in professional acting. The sound quality does start a little bit shaky, but will improve during the episode. So over to the cast and enjoy. So question we have, obviously we come from a recruitment background, right? So we run a recruitment business, but we have random, which you might know, specialisms, which is payroll, human resources and marketing. So joining us on the podcast, we have, let's start with yourself, Ben. Hello, my name's Benjamin O'Mahony. Uh, my name's Lana Wallace-Taylor. I'm Yana Penrose. And I'm Duncan Moore. Hello, welcome. The first question we have is, how do you guys manage multiple careers? Because when you're acting, I know that yourself, you have a massage business. Is that I do. Like? None of these guys know about that. Oh, oh, yeah. I've exposed oh, it. Oh. Why have I not had a massage yet? That very reason. <laughs> I, I feel bad. I've dropped me on the first question. I've dropped you right in it. So I don't it. You're obviously acting is your passion, right? So how difficult is it to juggle Juggling. multiple careers to make it work? I don't do much of that anymore. I used to have a couple of people who worked for me, and then I downsized the business and I decided to move away from it because it was taking too much admin time. And like, I've always done a few different bits. And they've all been kind of separate enough that they kind of slot together around my time frame. I've always tried to avoid having an employer. Just like being able to have some kind of autonomy or ability to slot things in rather than having to ask for time off, which I just do not do. So, uh, yeah, that voiceover, the teaching, coaching. Does it make it difficult to focus on acting? Uh, yes, to an extent. It depends how much time you actually have to do with acting. Like, whether, you know, um, yeah, I think I think it does sometimes. I know loads of mates decide to go and become personal trainers or train up and stuff. And they spend a period of time and they really throw themselves into it. And then all of a sudden they hate the fact they've built up this really successful job as a personal trainer because they want to be an actor. And then they loathe their day job. Sure. They feel like they're not doing their day, their real job. That makes sense. So Nigel's just uh, walked into the room. Hello, Nigel. Hello. I've got a question for you, actually, yeah. straight off the bat. So I was sat next to a colleague of mine who, this is his first piece of theatre he's ever seen, absolutely loved it. Yeah. And he had no questions at the start of this, and at half time he's given me all the questions. <laughs> um, he said, so I'm watching this, and yourself in the final scene, his question to me was, can you ask him what else does he do with the rest of his day? Does he literally just turn up? for the final part of the performance, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I literally get here about half nine, and then get my costume, no, I don't. Uh, we, all, we all get here for seven o'clock, uh, the show goes up at eight o'clock, we all get here for seven o'clock, uh, have a warm up together, that's quite important. And a chat. And a chat, and uh, review the day. And then uh, we all do our own thing, so we, we go, I get into costume, uh, read for a bit, and then go through my scripts, go and warm up myself. But yeah, and then, and then I don't really come on stage till nearly 10 o'clock, so it's, it's quite hard to stay mentally focused but then I come down here early and listen to Michelle's scene and kind of get myself a bit 
get my head in gear, uh, sure. as it were. And, uh, you do and stuff in the day as yeah, well, don't you? Yeah. You don't just come to the oh, goodness, yeah. mic. Yeah, so yeah. So, and I've got two kids, so it's really busy. My wife's an actress as well. So wow. we're usually juggling, juggling kids and, and kind of meeting at Charing Cross Station, swapping over and going to auditions. It's, it's, it's full on, but... You all play quite intense characters. How long does it take to get into character? Long? Uh, yeah, not very long, really. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, I think the, the main thing for me is like energy. So like making sure I've not done something in the day that, that I've, I'm energetic enough, I'm acting to exercise something, but that I'm not too tired or that I've got, that I feel like I'm in the right headspace. So we might do like a vocal warm up or something altogether or individually. And then just making sure that we have enough yeah, enough energy to like go into it and really bring it. Just yeah. professional, yeah, you know, to jump yeah. straight back into it. Yeah. Michelle Collins has just uh, joined us as well. Hello, Hi, Michelle. Hello. How are you? We're just saying how exhausting it looks to watch to play your parts. Like <laughs> yours in particular, you have that nervous energy that goes through. I watch it and I, I felt mad watching it. I saw I've seen it twice now. Oh, and really? both times I've gone back and I feel tired. <laughs> so it must be quite exhausting. I know you've got an early start tomorrow. I have got one question, which um, is actually from one of our clients who said, can you ask Michelle this question to ask it? It's, uh, it's career orientated. They say, when it comes to acting, what would constitute a promotion? Is it the size of the part, the medium it's shown in, i.e. radio, theatre, TV or film, or the size of the paycheck or something else? It's really hard because the word promotion doesn't really come into our world. It's quite a strange, I would never, I don't really know. It's just a really, it's a hard question because you know, your career is, I mean, sometimes your, your career is guided, sometimes it isn't. Some people go, oh, I've planned. But you're very, you're very lucky if you can plan your career, I think. Sure. I think it generally comes organically. Um, do you have an agent to get a job? So, I mean, what's a promotion? Like, I suppose if you, do, if you did, a, did a good TV role and then somebody saw you in that and then gave you another role in something else or or if you do a play and a casting director comes along and then might see you for, for another play so it's it, it's sort of a hard question I mean some of course all actors have to earn money yes sure. and sometimes for me particularly be having been a single parent for a long time I have taken jobs for money and I would admit that but then I've done other jobs that didn't pay at all but I really enjoyed them and they actually really paid off in the end. So I think you sort of know, and it's good if you can sort of mix and, and match it a bit really. But I think most people's careers, I don't know if, they, if there's anyone really, any actor who's had a career that's sort of gone in a straight line. I think your career's plateau. You go up and down, especially for women. It's very, women's careers are very different than men's, I think. That's interesting. Mm. Why is that? Children, family. Women don't generally get as, it's getting better in theatre to get as good roles as men, and men, women tend to give up sooner than men do. Or when men, when women take time off to have children, they go back, and they're often not in the same place where they left. It, it's sort of harder to get back on the ladder, sure. I think. And I think a lot of women, particularly sort of my, my, around my age, there aren't, well, I would say, the, 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 yes, that it's very competitive, but there are a lot of women of my age that gave up quite a long time ago because they couldn't sort of hack it, really. Right. And didn't, yeah, and it's, I think it's got harder, and I think uh, financially it's a very precarious industry. I hadn't realised You that. shouldn't really do it for the money. If someone says, sure. oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not a job to do for the money, you're mad. Like, you might as well go and be a banker or something. You know, it's... I hadn't realised that you yeah. had that... Um, that difficulty as a woman in the acting profession but because you probably have in your I industry, see it, I see right? it, we see it all the in time, right? Industries. And we get the stats that come back. Yeah. yeah, and it's exactly the same, but it's also reflected in the roles that are written for women on stage. Sure. Like there's a distinct imbalance between. I think it's getting like better. It is getting better, but it still needs to to shift to shift more. I mean, the last couple of years, because of what's happened in the industry, at least people are talking about it now and are aware of it. You know. So what's the most difficult role you have played in your career, which is varied, and how did you prepare for that? Oh, I don't know, I'm just trying to, uh, ooh, um, oh, I did, I played a role where I had to be in AA, and I'd never been in AA myself, and I had to go to um, an AA meeting, and I turned up at the wrong night, it was a boys brigade club. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so nervous, I'd, I'd sort of got myself so hyped up to go to this AA meeting, <laughs> 
No, love, sorry, that's tomorrow. <laughs> AA's tomorrow, really badly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just researching something. I'm not really, that's what they all say. Yeah, yeah, so I'm not really an AA. <laughs> Taking a method approach, right? So I had to, and then I also had to play, uh, I did a thing called The Illustrated Mom, a Jacqueline Wilson book, and I had to play uh, a woman who was um, seriously bipolar and um, was covered in, in all these tattoos. And, I, and um, actually, I didn't get paid very much money for that job, and it was over the summer, but I could take my daughter with me, who was about 10 at the time, and I just had a feeling that this job was going to be good. It was a female director. It was. It just felt good. And actually, that ended up bit winning an international Emmy in three BAFTAs. Wow. And I got paid hardly right. any money for that. But I had a really good feeling that that was going to be good, you know. And and I um and I did a lot of research for that. I read a couple of books. And um, I mean, if you can, you sh- you should. Most actors do. Most actors, if you're playing somebody that's sort of alien to you, I think you you do research. Mm. I think. You've all got quite um, very TV, or a lot of you've got a lot of TV background or film or different things. How different is it preparing for TV and film or even big, huge theatres with huge numbers to something that's so intimate as a space like this? Well, theatre's great because uh, you get the luxury of time and um, you, you, you generally have three to five weeks rehearsal process uh, to really talk about the character. And I think the first day of rehearsals, we just sat and talked about our characters. Uh, we're, we're, with TV, you don't get that luxury, and it's all very fast, and you know, it's 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 uh, you get upset, you've never, probably never you're let you You're expected before. to be prepared. Yeah, so so you, you've got to prepare, of course you have, but you just yeah. don't get the luxury of time, and you don't get, you know, with theatre, you know, all that kind of performances probably speak for everyone. It, it's kind of evolving a little bit, and and you know, certain things may change each each performance, and you know, and that's a good thing, I think. It, it's it's uh, you know, Charlotte's given us a really good platform. Uh, working with us, and now we, you know, it's ours now, and it's it's kind of we're building on it, and 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 it's it's changing, and it's you know it's very different because with TV you you you've never seen the set before probably, and and you've never met the actor that you might be working with, and all of a sudden you've got all this business to do, and you know you've got to go over there that you you know sit on that sofa that you've never seen before, and it's you know it can throw you a little bit, but you kind of anticipate that now, and it's you know it's it's different. That's good. Oh, you had a marketing specific question, didn't you? Yeah. So, I mean, how important for you guys is uh, personal branding in within the active profession, and how have you sort of seen this change uh, within the emergence of social media? Does that kind of affect the way you guys prepare for things or the way you conduct your yourself? Um, I I feel like I came out of drum school just as Twitter and stuff was becoming a thing. So we weren't told. I know that people now are told that you have to be on Twitter and stuff and have a an online presence, but I've got jobs from being on social media you know I've made life-changing connections from Twitter but I also know people that have lost jobs and that's not what you want to do so I think when you use it well like social media can can really help your career does it form part of your day-to-day careers now though you have to have a sort of moment of your day where you go I need to spend a little bit of time on social media I, I don't, but a mate, a mate of mine who I did a job with, he then went off and did a really like this is he wouldn't have any problem with me saying this, but he did a relatively small part in a in, in like a really small part in a in a big TV show which has a big American following, and he had maybe about I don't know 500, 600 Twitter followers, he'd done a few jobs and things like that, and he really dedicated himself to Twitter, like he he just he did about six months of intensively. Tweeting all the time, so he did it every time he was on the loo. Okay, yeah. Tweet on the loo, he followed everyone back, and he managed to grow his following from about 500 people to just under a million. Wow. In six wow. months, got a blue tick, and has used that to transfer that in kind of for quite good. He, he also was the artistic director of a theatre, like a really small community theatre. He managed to create events and channel it, make whole events where it channeled a whole revenue stream of funding into supporting. Uh, this television show that he was in, themed events around that, which people would fly in from the States for. He had maybe two scenes, two or three scenes over about two episodes. I'm talking like, but he built it up enough that he really sold it and he turned it into a revenue stream, not for himself so much, but more for the companies he was part of. And I really respected that. I thought that was That's great. It's impressive. Fantastic story. Mm. Um, Cody, you had a question for Michelle? In your whole acting career, um, what's the question you would have wished to have been asked but haven't? Oh, <laughs> so I can't answer that question. That's a really. Tell me what you mean. Like you must do loads of interviews, like, including this one, and 
there must be some aspect of what you've done that you've been really proud oh. of, but nobody's asked you about. Yeah, oh, God, that's a really tough <clears throat> one. What would I think? I think, I think having been sort of had a lot of my, been in a, in a soap a lot of the time, I think people tend to, what well, people's perceptions of you are very, people pigeonhole people into, we do it very much, in, not so much in America, I don't think, but we do love to put people into little boxes here, don't we? Mm. Um, you know, and, and, and no one has ever said, oh, would you, I've only ever done one Shakespeare ever, which is Romeo and Juliet, and I never went to drama school because I didn't get into drama school. I was turned down by 11 different drama schools. Wow. But look at you now. You've done amazing <laughs> I'm not saying that, you know, that, that, I mean, you know, I don't know, perhaps I should have gone to drama school, I don't know, I might have got some more Shakespeare. Maybe that's the question. Why did you get rejected from 11 drama schools? Yeah, what happened? I, I, it wasn't the right time for me. There weren't many working class kids around, really, that were, do, were, that were going to drama school, that, you know, there weren't really, you know, what was there on telly? There wasn't really, there weren't really any soaps. Um, there weren't, I mean, there were a few sort of decent dramas, I suppose, like Paper Today's, things like that. But there wasn't, there wasn't that much work around for working class actors at all and I think you know they had their they probably had their quota of a of a working class sort of cheeky mm. white girl do you know what I mean so um I think it's very different now but but in some ways I'm sort of glad that I didn't because I had a very varied career I you know I went I started off in the fridge and then I went to a pop band and diversified and did lots of different things so of course I've had a very very different career but um I don't know Recruiting top payroll talents is no easy task and the costs of making a poor hiring decision can be very expensive indeed. Luckily, there is a solution. My name is Nick Day and I am founder of JGA Payroll Recruitment. As the UK's leading payroll specialist recruiter, we know how to recruit top payroll talent. So if you're listening to this, worried about how you will get your next payroll out on time because either you don't have the expertise or the number of staff required to process it, why not give JGA Recruitment a call? Contact one of my team today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. You guys all know, obviously, know the show inside and out. You're calling it every night until the 28th of September. So there's still plenty of time for people listening to this to come and see the show. Sure, yeah. But because you all know it intimately now, which part do you think is the most challenging to play? Which one do you think is the most fun to play? So if you could swap parts or pick a part, <laughs> most challenging and most fun. So um my character Peter is on stage for the whole time and she meets a series of different characters um throughout the course of two weeks. It's over set over two weeks. Um, and they're all people that she meets as she moves to London. So my character stays on stage throughout and interacts with each as they come on. So I think in terms of duration and amount to learn. Mine is definitely the hardest, but I might say that Nigel's is the hardest, actually, I think. And I think that Ben has the most enviable part. So Ben yeah. has like a really fun, <laughs> cheeky, chappy kind Mine's of deep. like, uh, quite like taking his clothes off, basically. <laughs> <laughs> he's in his pants all the time. He's very like uh, comedic, very vibrant, very energetic, and he's great at, obviously. I'd say Nigel is the most challenging because there's there are so many questions that people have, I feel like, I don't know if you guys have seen it, at the point at which he comes into the play, that need answering in 15 minutes. And I think that that's really, and so much of the dialogue in that scene is so like broken and repeated and looking at it in the rehearsal room, it's really difficult to like find a path of, of where that goes. And I think that, I find that the most challenging scene of the bunch. What do you think, man? Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess so. But I love playing the part, and uh, I, I, as soon as I read it, I wanted to do it. And um, reading the whole play, I, I don't know how Lana stays in character because, well, not stays in character, but without any breaks, and plays each of those scenes where she's in a different mood, she's got a different kind of um, outlook. It, it, it's all—it's so difficult with no breaks. 
And I learned the other night that she doesn't even get a sip of water. Yeah. You know, I'll be mean, <laughs> sitting in that dressing room with you for a <laughs> <laughs> That's the hardest thing. If you turned up at my drama school, I wouldn't let you in there. I'm going in there, I'm going in there, I'm going in there. She's an absolute lollipop. And the hair extensions. I've got hair extensions. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly different questions though, Yana. Hello. Would you recommend acting as a career choice for those that are, you know, <laughs> young, they're enthusiastic, they think, I want to be an actor. My daughter, she's 10 years old, she wants to be uh, an actress when she grows up. Is it a career choice you would recommend? Y yes. No, yes. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard out here. So would I recommend it? Yeah. Whenever you ask an actor that question, they're like, no way. And we were joking about it, weren't we? But we'd never recommend it. But... I I can't imagine ever like doing anything else. Ever, well, except for the like, the add-on jobs to make acting happen. Sure. I can't imagine doing anything else. But I think it is worth considering uh, the risks and the lifestyle before you enter the industry. I think a lot of people sometimes go to drama school, say they want to become actors, or you know, accidentally become actors, or whatever, and they don't understand what it's like to be an actor practically when you're not in the rehearsal room or on stage having a great time. Like, what is it when you're like, oh my God, how am I going to pay my rent this month? And sure. when's the exhibition coming in? And oh my God, does my agent hate me? And the moment that those worries and concerns start to take over the joy of the doing it a bit, that's when you should stop. And I, I don't yeah. necessarily recommend acting, but I recommend doing something that you love with your whole heart. And acting is not just theatre, like there are so many amazing jobs in theatre that are designing, that are yeah. writing, that are sound, that are production, that are casting, that are like, although the actors, the people that you see on stage, I think sometimes people think that that's all there is and that there's so many amazingly creative and more lucrative yeah. <laughs> like jobs you can do in theatre and it's not just about that. Yeah, and also there's so much more to the job, isn't there, of being yeah. an actor than just kind of what you you see, you know, in the final edit on TV yeah. or on stage. There's so much stuff that surrounds it. That um... Are you good at time management? Are you highly motivated when there's no one else there to, like, push you into sending emails? What a tax is. What a tax is. <laughs> there we go. It's like that. <laughs> just yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, all the other stuff. But it's quite fun. Yeah, yeah, it's really fun. So... When we're talking about the payroll tax piece, when it comes to things like payroll and you are running multiple jobs and you've got different people paying you from different streams, like how complex can it be for you guys to, you know, to have your payroll run correctly? If it's, not, if it's not, what happens? Like, where do you go? To begin with, you earn nothing. <laughs> so it's <laughs> yeah. really easy. And then when you do earn, it becomes complicated specifically when you do earn it in different countries and different tax and things sure. like that. that can that was the first time when I was like, this is a pain, a real pain. Trying to deal with an American tax system, a South African tax system, and like an Irish tax system, wherever you are, and you are a non domicile, so you're like, you're trying to deal with those. And if you're cheap like me and you can't be bothered to hire an accountant <laughs> and you hate the idea of not knowing how it works, you just spend your whole time reading about weird tax rules and look like not ways to get around it in any way, but ways to at least understand how you're supposed to do it, how you're supposed to go but I paid it there, what do I do with this and that and this? That side of it took a bit of work. But when you're not earning much, it's really easy. Yeah, you just yeah. got a, like, you've yeah. got hardly anything to put in the earning brackets and loads of the expenses and then you don't earn anything. But also it's so variable. Like One year mm. you can earn loads and the next year you can earn not so much. And that's also something that... HMRC make it quite difficult for us. Mm. In and hard sense. to plan for, right? Yeah, yeah. because right. how are you a mortgage to company know? as well? Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. So I've got a mortgage, got a house, all cool, fine. And then you come to, you realise, oh God, God, I've got to keep my accounts mm. looking really stable in a job that goes up and down. Sure. Because I've got to, my accounts have to be readable to someone who has no idea what the life of an actor is like and yeah. knows that it will go up and down. So you need to be like, okay. I've got to make sure I there's a threshold under which I do not earn because my accounts have to look stable. I need to look like a business someone wants to invest in. And also having to pay tax on account, which really oh, frustrates me. Yeah, sure. You, know, you have to pay half of what, you, what they estimate you'll earn next mm. year. I think it's a good thing that the government's bringing in 
doing the tax every three months or yeah. because it's just going to kick a lot of people there's, the there's a lot of backlash around that from equity though which right. is our trade union in terms of uh, making tax digital because I mean there are far more well read people about this than me but the equity don't like it because it's they say that in the long run it's more expensive for us in terms of accountants but also the it makes it even harder to track how much you will learn over so long so all that um that yeah. account where you pay more in yeah. advance all that's going to be a lot more difficult i mean yeah yeah mm -hmm. no, apparently it's, it makes it more hard that way. so last couple of questions so I know that you've been really kind of giving your time away this evening, which is fantastic. I know it's quite late and the bar is closing. <laughs> so for those that haven't seen the show yet, I'm going to try and spin this around really quick so some of our listeners get access to it. Tell us individually or collectively a little bit about what the show is about and why people should come and see it. The show is about a girl who moves from Liverpool to London in search of a new life and something better that she can't quite put her finger on and she meets all these people along the way who are inspiring and interesting and who give her something that she hasn't necessarily experienced before in Liverpool but it doesn't necessarily go the way she wants it to. People keep saying this to me and I think we forget it or I certainly forget it as a cast member. It's also a kind of a kind of mystery right? It's kind of a, yeah. a kind of a puzzle as well. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot. It's not just a, a linear story. It's unusual, and it does, yeah, mystery. But a sort of funny mystery. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's not. It's not uh, Agatha Christie. It's. Uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> it's it's the first few scenes are very funny and very there's a lot funny, of laughs there. Funny. Yeah. Um, I remember describing it as a comedy about loneliness and identity. Yeah. And mental, mental health. It's mental health, yeah. Yeah. you know, a lot of the characters... Are, but it doesn't stay too serious style. for too long. No, yeah. It doesn't treat it in a kind of unbelievably heavy, serious way. Yeah. It, it, it also pokes fun at the peculiarities of all yes. of us, really, and hopefully does it in a way that has enough energy that it keeps it... and turns it into for quite a large part of the play something quite enjoyable to have, carry along with them, you know, to discover the story of. Mm -hmm. yeah. So last question for me is going to be to the director, Charlotte, who oh, is sat here listening to this as we go. <laughs> so you've interpreted Chloe Moss's works in this performance. What's been the biggest challenge for you moving, you know, bringing your own interpretation to the work? What's been the biggest challenge given this production where we are now? I think that when people see the play, as we were saying, it's a mystery. And so when we were reading the play, there were lots of different ways we could go with the production. And actually working out the way we wanted to interpret the characters, put those characters in front of an audience, working out the way we wanted to go from scene to scene, what we wanted the audience to get from each scene, what we wanted them to get from Peter's character. I think that's, that's been the most exciting and biggest challenge collectively, because most plays give you all the information you need. And this one is really exciting because you get to read so much in between the lines. As, an, as a director, you get to work with a company to kind of figure those things out. So I think that's been the biggest, the biggest challenge. May I just say a special thanks to the cast and crew of How Love Is Spelt. As I mentioned, it's playing at the Southwark Playhouse until the 28th of September. So still plenty of time to book your tickets online. In the meantime, thank you very much for joining me on the Payroll Podcast. And I look forward to joining you all again in a couple of weeks. Take care. Thanks guys for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Cheers guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Payroll Podcast. My name is Nick Day and I am founder of JGA Recruitment. We are a specialist payroll recruiter, so if you have a payroll vacancy that needs assistance, please get in touch. All contact details can be found in the episode notes. In the meantime, tune in to future episodes of the Payroll Podcast by subscribing to the show on any of your favourite podcast channels. Till next time. <laughs>